Become a better listener and you'll be able to design services that are more inclusive, do less harm and are better for business. But how? Well, that's exactly what the book titled Time to Listen is all about and you'll get the key highlights from the author herself in this episode. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi everyone, it's Indy Young and this is the Service Design Show number 165. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make all the difference between success and failure all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business, and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Indy Young. Indy is a researcher who teaches, writes, and coaches about inclusive product strategy. Amongst many things, Indy has pioneered opportunity maps, mental model diagrams, and thinking styles. If you're like most service design professionals, you already know the value qualitative data can bring to business. But often, qualitative data is still seen as less valid or as less credible. It's not seen as a useful tool to inform strategy. In our latest book, Time to Listen, Indy provides a much needed process and framework to overcome this limiting belief, helping you to make smarter decisions and also design services that are more inclusive and less harmful without sacrificing business value. If anything, your services will become more profitable. As you might have guessed by the title of the book, the secret lies in becoming a better listener. In this episode, we explore what that means for you as a professional. How do you actually do that? Is this something anyone can learn or is this a born talent? You'll hear us talk a lot about how to set up and structure listening sessions, but it is important to know that this interview in itself is not a listening session. There is a big difference in the dynamic between the two and you'll discover why throughout this conversation. By the end of this episode, you should have a good idea how you can turn open and honest conversations with your users into nothing less than one of your most valuable business assets. If you're interested in reading Indy's book, make sure to stick around till the end of the episode because we announce a contest where you can win a special edition of the book. If you enjoy conversations like this that help you to grow as a service design professional, make sure you click that subscribe button and of course that bell icon to be notified when a new episode comes out. That about wraps it up for the introduction and now it's time to sit back, relax and enjoy the conversation with Indy Young. Welcome back to the show, Indy. Thank you so much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be back. It was episode 130, so 35 episodes ago that you were on and then we already talked about the book, which we're going to dive in today, but the book wasn't out there then yet. It was July 2021, I think. Oh, wow. So it, the book didn't come out until July 2022. Well, <laughs> but it is now in physical form. <laughs> yeah, there <Woo> it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would love to dive into what eventually uh, got into the book, what got published, what got censored, and what has been taken into part two. Uh, but, Indy, before we can do that, uh, maybe some people haven't listened to episode 130 yet and have no. 35. Oh, 30. Yeah, 130. You're right. Yeah, we're at 165 yeah. right ah. now. Um, but they would like to know, okay, who is Indy and why is she on the show? So could you maybe give a brief introduction? Yes, certainly. So I am an inclusivity researcher. Uh, this is the way that I've been um, managing to help people recognize that the um, that uh, the cycles of research that we're doing in our orgs generally don't hit uh, the inclusivity uh, side of things. 
Um, so that's what I'm doing is I'm out in the world trying to help everybody get to that point. I'm giving uh, lots of methods. And if you follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram, um, and now Mastodon, but I have not figured that out yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I have a lot of helpful stuff out there, a lot of helpful stuff on my website. My whole goal is to try to help um, people, you know, pick up what skills that they want, figure out how to adapt those skills to the situation they're in and figure out how to, you know, help each other and listen. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. Uh, we have a uh, five question lightning round to get to know you a little bit better. I haven't checked which questions I asked you previously, but I think these one will be different. And if they are the same, then we'll be able to check if anything uh, changed since the last time. So five questions for you. Um, please answer them as briefly and as quickly as possible. The first thing that comes to your mind. Ready? Ready. The I do remember one of the old questions, mm. so we'll see if you okay. ask it again. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, the first one should be easy. Um, is there a book that you are currently reading? Uh, and if so, which one is it? Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Ke Kemmerer. Okay, interesting. We'll add a link in the show notes as always. Um, another question is, what was your first job? Uh, do you mean going all the way back to teenagers? <laughs> in, uh, let's do that, that one and your professional job. So like, what was your oh, unofficial job professional. And, and your first professional? My first professional job was um, as a software designer at, uh, I can't even remember the name of the field, but it was, um, it was working on space well, stuff that goes into space and orbits the Earth. <laughs> Sounds like a satellite. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Thank you. It's a little early. I haven't booted up my mind. What is that word? <laughs> and what was your teenage job? An uh, that, that was just doing odd jobs for people around. We lived in a country kind of neighborhood and I would wash windows. I would, you know, clean gardens. I would... Um, clean houses. And my favorite part of it was where one of the neighbors hired me to clean the garden a couple of times and they had this giant vacuum. <laughs> it was awesome. You could vacuum up the leaves. <laughs> <laughs> the pleasure of having a giant vacuum. All right. Uh, I'll take oh, yeah. that one. Um, <laughs> we have to move on, Indy. Uh, this is a, a new question, so I definitely haven't asked that uh, one before. What is your mm -hmm. favorite meal? your favorite food well okay i can answer the second part of that meal i can't answer favorite food chocolate chocolate okay yeah i eat at least two ounces a day <laughs> good for you <laughs> what a what a sip of wine would be helpful um please let's talk about location if you could work from anywhere in the world where would you like to work from Ooh, i have worked from a lot of different places in the world and it actually doesn't make a difference um, and in fact, when I was working from the big island, Hawaii, it was really actually annoying to look out the window and see the palm trees mm. and recognize how gorgeous it was outside. And I was still stuck inside. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Makes yeah. sense. Uh, and the last question, I have to ask it because it's a tradition. Do you recall the first time you heard about or got in touch with service design? Uh, you know, I think it was either Kim... Or it was one of my um, peers, and she was, I think, either in the UK or in the Netherlands. I think it was the UK, and she's like, service design, everything's service design here, but it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, these answers. Now we know a bit more about uh, who you are uh, and not just a professional. Like we're trying to get a, a broader perspective on the guests on the show. So thank you, Indy. Uh, and now let's talk about the book. I had to uh, write down the title. It's called Time to Listen, How Giving People Space to Speak Drives Inno Invention and Inclusion. Yeah, I can never remember the subtitles of my books. <laughs> never. I always have to look them up. Time to listen. I can remember. <laughs> Time to listen. Let's let's start uh, with that because that's always uh, an interesting story. The title, like, mm -hmm. what's with the title? 
I did a lot of social media in, you know, sort of discussions with a lot of people and threw a lot of different titles out there. Um, and a lot of people, I, I, a lot of the ways that I was coming at it sounded too much. I was working with an editor who wanted to write a business book and everybody on social media was saying, that sounds like an airport book, but I don't want to read it. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, we have to get something more, less airport booky, right? Um, and the idea of time came into it. Listen, always had to be in the title. Um, the course that is the twin to this is called Listening Deeply. And I was just going to call the book the same thing, but the idea of time was really important. Um, one, you can take it in two ways. One is that we, um, it, 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 it's, hard to get time. It's also hard to keep track of time these days. <laughs> what day is the week? Is it um, quick, right? Uh, you have to think about it. And dealing with time after the pandemic has also been a really interesting sort of thing that a lot of people are talking and writing about. Um, and so time became like a part of it in terms of how do we make time for this? How do we take the time to fit this in, I've always been talking about it in terms of, you know, it doesn't fit in your normal cycles. It is not a part of the agile cycle. It is not a part of any of your solution space cycles. It is separate and therefore it takes a separate kind of time. Um, and, and so I thought, okay, let's put time in there because time also means uh, an imperative. Hey, it's time. We have gotten to this point where we have harmed a lot of people with the services we're creating in ways that we don't even recognize. So I've had circulating on social media, and I've talked about it in a bunch of talks, this um, first draft idea of talking about harms in different levels, um, where we've got harms at the mild level, which is frustration and confusion and things like that. And that's, yeah organizations understand that that can be a problem and they will look into that and try to fix it. But serious harms like um, being triggered, like, uh, you know, maybe being interrupted, like feeling unwelcome, like feeling as if uh, you were not the type of person that they want here. Um, that's serious harm and we're doing it. Mm. I've, there's also something beyond that called lasting harm and something beyond that called systemic harm, which is where it's gotten baked into our laws and our culture and stuff like that. So, um, so the, the imperative it's time, it's time. Now we've done enough harm. We need to face like investigate, see, understand, dig into one of those verbs <laughs> who we're trying to support and what they are trying to get done and the way that our solutions are messing it up for them are, you know, causing them distress, causing them, um, you know, to have to stop one thing and go do a different thing. Uh, <laughs> I have many, many, many examples. So we could talk about that. There's also a lot of books that talk about the harms. Um, for instance, Kat Holmes has written Mismatch, um, which is this idea that, you know, a disabled person is not disabled. They are a whole person. They're only disabled by society. Society looks at them as disabled. And the way that we talk about it, the way that we support them is still quite harmful in a lot of ways. There, there's progress being made. So that's a really good example. There are a lot of other books and I talk about them in, in my presentations. You can go on my website and watch one of the presentations and see that screen and go and read those books. I'm not going to write a book about that. That's not my uh, expertise. My expertise is understanding, is finding out, is developing a deep understanding based on patterns that are verifiable, that are repeatable, that any two researchers can find the same patterns and paying attention to that so that we can then start measuring, you know, is this thinking style being supported? Is that thinking style being harmed? Um, 
what can we do? Where do we want to focus next? There's always going to be like, you know, 13 different areas you could focus and you can't do them all now. You can't do them even next year. It's something that takes years to get through, but you need a map. You need some sort of way to understand, okay, here are all the holes, here are the gaps. And where do we want to focus first and why? And how do we do the best, um, the best good for the most people? Um, not in terms of writing one service for all of them, creating one service for all of them, but for cr creating different services with different nuances. Awesome. Uh, that was an interesting explanation of <laughs> the title, and I feel that we uh, we have so many hooks to go into. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You mentioned a few times, I'm going to reference uh, uh, some elements that you mentioned. Um, you mentioned a few times, it's time for this. And I could fill in the blank what this is, maybe listening, but what is this to you? What is it time for? It's time for listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's time for doing all these things. Yeah, I, 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 it's time to pay attention to the harms. Okay. That's what I'm saying. And I think we've got a little bit of a wave, even partially globally, in terms of, oh, hey, you know, it is important to stop harming. We've, we've got a wave for sure in, it is important to stop harming our planet. Um, it is important to stop harming ecosystems. It's important to stop harming people as well. And um, there was something I put out in the US, we have this day after Thanksgiving where apparently everybody goes shopping for Christmas. I've never done it. <laughs> so um, I, I don't know if it still exists or if it's just a, a dream of the marketers, but they call it Black Friday, not because something horrible has happened. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, it's dismal and that kind of interpretation of it. Um, also, that word, using the word black is like, is that calling it? into uh, effect the race and, and like subjugating that word. But <laughs> oddly, the title Black Friday actually refers to the idea that the vendors, the, the commercial vendors who are selling all this stuff are finally in the black. They are not in the red. So they're not, they've not sold enough stuff until the day after Thanksgiving which is towards the end of November. So I'm like, okay, what kind of business model is that? <laughs> <laughs> but okay, all that aside. Anyway, so I put a, I put a tweet or a post out on, um, on Black Friday. I'm like, hey, you know, a lot of online vendors say, hey, you can have free shipping if you meet this um, number, like criteria of how much you spend, right? Which... When I'm reading Braiding Sweetgrass by Rod, Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, she's talking about indigenous American worldviews. And one of the worldviews is that we've become a very consumption oriented society, especially in the US. Um, there are pockets that don't um, for sure, but it seems to be like the, the milieu of the US is to like go out and shop. And, um, and you, don't, you don't need those things. And by having, by, by recognizing that what we're doing, if we're providing, um, you know, goods or even services, but probably goods that we're going to have to ship physically. And we're saying, Hey, buy just a little bit more and we'll give you free shipping. That's encouraging overconsumption. And I got some people like going, yeah, oh yeah, I see that. And other people are like, well, how's a, you know, how's my business going to make a profit? And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly the question. We have to rethink this. I'm, I'm written. You shared a lot of things, and uh, I'm curious, who did you have in mind when you were writing uh, this book? Like, who was your ideal reader? Did, uh, did you have one? I had a couple. Mm -hmm. um, one one ideal reader is a product manager, a product strategist. Um, I'm assuming that there's the equivalent title in service uh, side of things. We just, on this side of the Atlantic, we tend to say product instead of service. To me, I like to say solution uh, because then that sort of encompasses everything. Anything you're doing to support somebody. 
And the people who are in charge of the strategy or in charge of the management of one of those parts of the things that you're creating was one of my key audiences. The other key audience is the people who are actually doing the research. And another key audience, especially for the beginning of the book, because I talk about how we're looking at understanding people. We're looking at building knowledge from the lens of our solution. And that limits the kind of knowledge that we're building and it limits the kind of decisions that we make. And so I would like people who are higher up in an organization to become aware of that. So that was a sort of tertiary audience. It's like, hey, let's frame our knowledge building by the person's purpose, not by our solution. But what is the person trying to address? And that purpose can be big or small or long-term or short-term. Um, but let's look at it from that point of view. And that gives us, it takes away the lens of our solution and allows us to see really what that person was trying to get done, not just what they were trying to get done with relationship to our solution. How do you hope, um, and maybe you've already got some uh, feedback, uh, how do you hope it will impact the practice of these product managers, service managers, solutions managers? How I hope that... Um, so some of the other work I'm doing, we're doing a workshop or, or mid-January about persuading your stakeholders. Um, so, so some of the other work I'm doing is around positioning this in your world, getting budget for it, um, making it a priority, learning how to talk about it as something that should be a priority within your organization. And that's, that's something that, um, that I hope eventually. I don't think it's going to happen right away, but especially if we can get people in positions of power and people who are coming in brand new to this, um, understanding the mindset of looking at people in terms of their purpose, uh, a lot of this knowledge, a lot of the mixed methods, a lot of the ways that we do our product roadmap or service roadmap um, are going to shift. They're going to shift mm. a little bit so that we're more inclusive. So that in the end, what we're doing is we're creating solutions that support, that don't harm a variety of thinking styles, a, a, a whole bunch of various approaches, not just one approach, not just the thinking style that your team thinks is the main thinking style. Um, often, this is just an assumption, uh, how many scenarios and product roadmaps have you seen out there, especially scenarios where the there's a character, but the character is not identified. Even if you have personas, they're not identified as one persona or another. It's just the character. And then it becomes like the average user. And that's the big thing that I want to shift. I want lots of different solutions out there that support the variety of thinking styles and a variety of approaches to a person's purpose. This is where we're going to be able to address the harms that we're mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question that I also had around is like, is that quote unquote the problem with our current approach that it is, uh, for lack of a better word, a lazy approach, like going for the average user, I don't know. It, I, I don't think, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, lazy, yeah, for yeah. lack of a better, yeah, yeah. lazy is not the word for sure. We just, we're learning, mm. we're building mm -hmm. this. Right. Um, I expect when I finally get to retire, more people are going to build it farther. And then they're the next generation after them. They're going to build it farther. We're we're still figuring this out. Um, I think this goes for civic design as well. We're still figuring out how to do it better. We've got this technology. At first, the technologists are all like, "Ooh, technology can solve everything. Um, and they don't have the human component involved. They also don't have the non-human people component involved. <laughs> and it's slowly something that we're finally addressing. And I think it'll become a part of the way that we do things mm -hmm. in, you know, the next 20, 50 years. Um, and then the next 50 years after that, there will, I mean, it's always going to evolve. We're going to get better um, if we're all still around. <laughs> I, I would I would love to uh, go in a bit deeper on like the this 
part. So you mentioned uh, that we have to make time for this because it falls outside of the agile cycle, mm -hmm. the product development. And then mm -hmm. um, like, <clears throat> what is it that we actually need to do? Like, can you, right. and, and I guess yeah. that's, that's what the book is yeah. about. What do we need to yeah. do? Yeah. What do we need to do? There are cute little uh, sketch cartoony diagrams of all the steps of what we need to do. We need a strategy space. First of all, there is strategy, but it tends to only be discussed among certain people at your organization. And there's more knowledge that can be built into the strategy that allows us to have a better, more inclusive strategy. So we need a strategy space, but to understand where to take that strategy or what to base it on, we need a problem space. And in the problem space, that's where we're looking at the person uh, once, you know, once a year, once every other year, we're building some knowledge, we're picking a purpose. It might be some part of the purpose that our organization uh, is interested in supporting, or it could be a, a slightly larger purpose. I talk a lot about how purposes come at different levels of granularity and what that means for the way that you build knowledge. I have a chapter in there about, um, about how to figure out. I also teach a course that gets into a lot more depth than the book on how to figure out how to, what knowledge you need and how to frame the way that you're going to build that knowledge that you need right now and how to make sure you're not building knowledge that you don't need right now. Uh, Erica Hall has a book called Just Enough Research. Um, that's a great title. You don't want to do research for research's sake. You want to do research to build knowledge that you need. And I'm saying the knowledge that we need is this, we need to build a better strategy that's more informed by what people are trying to address rather than a strategy that's just, you know, let's uh, take this piece of tech and make it into something people can use. I. You don't know how many people I have talked to. They're like, oh yeah, my manager told me to build a chat bot for that, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so stop being technology driven, but that, you know, that's painting technology in a bad light and technology, it can be very helpful to humanity, but it is not right now helpful to all of humanity and is quite harmful to a lot of humanity. So this deeper knowledge and problem space is trying to understand, first of all, what knowledge do we need? How are we going to frame it? We're going to frame it by a person's purpose. We're going to frame evaluative studies. We're going to frame generative studies. We're going to frame problem space studies by a person's purpose so that when we've got it in the strategy space, we can layer it all together on the same skeleton. It's easy, it's easy to see how it fits together because you're talking about a purpose or some sort of sub-purpose. So that's the first step. The second step. Uh, go yeah, ahead. yeah, yeah. I will, I will get I hope we'll get into the <laughs> second step because Yes. Uh, the second step is listening. <laughs> Can you uh, maybe color this first step with an example or a story? So we need more strategy space and uh, like, what does that look like? What does better look yeah. like in this case? Yeah. Okay. So here's a good story. Um, in, there was a big company that in, uh, they were building their own towers, office towers downtown. And then the pandemic hit. And then the office towers ended up getting finished and they wanted everybody to go back to the office towers in 2021. And not everybody was ready to do that. But that wasn't the only thing that was happening. They were losing people. People were, you know, doing this great resignation thing. They're like, oh yeah, you know, if you look at the big data, it's just like, oh yeah, a lot of people are resigning now. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe they're being lazy or maybe they've decided to, you know, change careers. I don't know what they're guessing, right? From the big data. But what we did was some knowledge building, like what, what's going on? What's going through people's minds? Um, is it because they're being asked to come into this fancy new building downtown or is it something else? And it turns out after we did a whole bunch of listening sessions and this, I was just um, helping to guide the team. This was done by a lot, uh, a research team within the organization. 
and headed up, uh, the person who was helping define what knowledge we needed was uh, one of the heads of HR. So the idea was, like, what you know, what goes through people's minds if they're considering the situation and maybe thinking about leaving. So we, uh, the team, listened to people who were in that situation, and what came out of it was. Um, a bunch of things that weren't necessarily the things that you would have guessed. One was, hey, I took this job because I was promised X and Y. And sure, the pandemic came along and we're stringing me along. But, you know, it's been two years, two and a half years, um, maybe three years because I joined a while before the pandemic. And I still haven't gotten X or Y in this job. I'm tired. I'm going to give up. This is not the job I want. Okay. So. That's one of the findings. Um, and, you know, as HR, how do you support that? Oh, there's ways to support that, <laughs> right? There was another um, thinking style that was about, um, you know, things are really rocky right now. And I've been seeing people actually getting laid off within this organization. And then I see other people just leaving and I'm worried about my own job and I desperately need this job. So I'm going to, you know, sort of hunker down at my desk and work really hard and hope that that work and my, you know, value to the company is considered when they think about laying me off. Okay. Yeah. Can, yeah. yeah can You've I... heard these things. Yeah. That, there's a couple more I could talk about, but, but as you can see, it's like for each one of those, for the person who's like, I didn't get X and Y, um, or I'm going to hunker down and just like hope uh, that people notice HR can do stuff. And it's different. HR stuff. can do yeah, stuff. Yeah. 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 And yeah. it's different stuff. Yeah. You, yeah. you, um, uh, you mentioned something really briefly, which I think is key to the entire story. And I can imagine that you sort of, uh, are so used to it that it's easy to overlook, but you mentioned, yeah, yeah. Then, uh, they just listened to these people. We went into a listening session and then the, all this came out. Like if it yeah. was that easy, like everybody yeah. would be doing it. So what kind of yeah. magic happens uh, uh, in that in that short, brief uh, sentence, they just listened? Yeah, that's the whole reason for the book, right? <laughs> um, when you listen uh, in ordinary life, we're typically thinking. And when we're thinking, our cognition, our brain is full of our own thoughts and we miss what the other person is saying or we miss parts of it. Um, we maybe hear some keywords that make us think some other thoughts. Um, so, so basically what I'm training people to do, and this is something that you can do like half-assed at first and still get some pretty good knowledge out of the listening sessions. And then as you get better at it, things will get even deeper. So there's a way to measure it, but let me talk about listening first. Listening is all about building a sensor, building a sensor in your mind for a couple of things so that you can pay rapt attention to that person so that you're really aware of everything that they're saying, what the subtexts are, what the connections, you know, like they said that word before, and now they're saying this word again, but it's slightly different. What does it mean? Um, that kind of thing, but you're not thinking about it. You're just noticing. It's just a sensor. And the sensor is after a couple of things. Uh, one is, are we getting to their interior cognition? Okay, now to ask that question, I have to talk about these two other things. One is purpose, right? We actually come at these listening sessions with one germinal question, which is what went through your mind as you addressed that purpose in the past? We are not talking about your current in session cognition. We want memory mode. We want someone talking about their cognition from the past because it's really hard and awkward and leads to a bunch of like circuitous, like I didn't really mean that, but I'll say it this way because I think that's what they want me to say kind of stuff, right? So in the past, what was your interior cognition? Um, the second thing is that we do not have a list of questions. We do not have a list. Uh, so a list of questions makes some people freak out. I'm like, fine, write down some list of questions, but don't bring up any topics that they haven't brought up. 
Okay. That's the easier way. And that's like, oh, okay, fine. I'll have this list of questions for the just in case net, like I fall off the trapeze, right? But I'm just going to follow up on all the topics that they bring up, just like you're doing right now, mm -hmm. except you're doing it with the idea of um, like informing your audience as opposed to getting to interior cognition. So go that takes us back to interior cognition. Interior cognition is inner thinking, emotional reactions, and guiding principles that went through somebody's mind in the past as they were addressing that purpose or some part of the purpose that to them is related to that purpose. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this allows us to hear about things that we didn't realize we needed to ask about. <laughs> um, yeah. And so the idea of interior cognition is that we are trying to develop cognitive empathy. Cognitive empathy is understanding somebody's inner thinking, emotional reactions, and guiding principles that went through their mind in the past. <laughs> I frame it in the past because it's just so much easier for a person to talk about their interior cognition that way. So cognitive empathy is scalable. Cognitive empathy, if you ask 10 people, if you ask 20 people the same germinal question, what went through your mind as you were addressing this purpose in the past, you're going to find patterns. So that's the way that we get empathy, cognitive empathy, a very specific kind of empathy, scalable in our org. That's the way that we can find patterns across a bunch of different people. So I did a bunch of listening sessions about what went through people's minds in a near miss accident. Okay. This was interesting because everybody's near miss accident was in a totally different context, right? Um, some people were in the swimming pool. Some people were in a car. Some people were about to go into uh, the Twin Towers before it got bombed. Um, there was a lot of, uh, there's some people were in Kiev when it got bombed by Russia. So there's a lot of near miss accidents. And you would think, how am I gonna find patterns across those stories? Cause they're very different. And the patterns come from the focus of mental attention. So that's uh, the idea that when you're in a near miss accident, there's the, the part of it where you're like, how do I get out of this safely? And there's also a part of it that's like, did anybody else get hurt? Can I help anybody? right? There's the part of it where you're maybe angry at the other person for causing this or for being irresponsible. Not everybody is going to think that, um, but there are focuses of mental attention that become the patterns. We don't know them in the beginning, but we find them from the bottom up. So this is abductive <laughs> data synthesis, abductive research, not deductive research, where we come into it with a hypothesis. What we're doing is we're creating a load of information in that strategy space that we can start using in our solution space. And that's where we can start making some deduction, deductive um, hypotheses and start testing them. So many things to double click on and to Google further, but I'll, I'll pick one. Uh, <laughs> as you see, I'm sort of uh, uh, ripping the entire story apart, trying to, to uh, be very selfish and, uh, and learn more uh, here. You mentioned patterns a few times, like patterns emerge and it's abductive. I, I totally get that. Uh, a question that might arise here is, why does it matter? So uh, <laughs> you have these patterns, um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask two questions and then it's up to you in which order you want to uh, uh, ask them. So why do these patterns matter? And uh, the patterns that you might find might be different than I will find. Or are they? This is like a lay yeah. layup. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's a leading question because you and I know. <laughs> um, this. Okay, so why do the patterns matter? The patterns matter because with both quantitative and qualitative data, there's an empirical end of it where it's verifiably observed. Multiple different people will be able to see that, they'll be able to reproduce it. There's also a subjective end to both quantitative and qualitative where it's just a one-off. Um, with qualitative, this happens a lot. 
you'll go, you'll do interviews and you'll take one of those stories or you'll make a story that come from like two or three people um, and use that story to get attention from your stakeholders. Okay. That's what we're doing, (laughs) but that's not a pattern. It might be a pattern, but we don't know. There's, there's this idea of like, oh, let's go out and listen to somebody once a week. But if you don't frame it by the same purpose, if you frame it by the solution, you're not going to get patterns and you're going to get, this is the quintessential, like the sales guy went out and, you know, this one client wants X feature. (laughs) And so we'll go make X feature. And it turns out that there's nobody else who wants it or like very few other people who want it except that one client. And maybe that client, you know, has a big budget and you want to keep them happy. Okay. There's that as a reason for doing it. But if we don't look at the other ideas out there, the other things that people are trying to get done, we are harming the other people, right? So patterns are super important because otherwise it's just anecdotes, just one-off stories, Um, we're not, we're we're basing our entire organization and strategy on one-off stories. Not a great idea. This is actually how (laughs) a lot of startups go, you know, try to take off and they just don't, they get to the end of the runway and they crash because they're doing it from their own point of view. So if you take, and I've done this with a lot of startups, if we take some time, time again, right? To go and frame it by a person's purpose, get a whole bunch of stories that then have different focuses of mental attention that have affinity. You're like, oh, here's a pattern. All right. If we have that, then we know, okay, as we're going forward, trying to get off this runway, we're going to focus on just this part. And we're going to do a really, really good job on that part. And we're going to support this thinking style for this particular part of the approach. And maybe that thinking style too, um, but maybe just one thinking style to get off the runway. And then we're going to start generating some income and we can move to the second thinking style. So that's what, um, (laughs) that's why. (laughs) So the idea of doing, let's see, the second question was the, um, the leading one, yes. Right? So uh, your patterns will be different than mine. So it's still subjective, yeah. Yeah. and like, how is that different than an or more valuable yeah. than an anecdote? So it won't. Our patterns will be the same because you and I both know what to look for. We're looking for those three things. We're looking for inner thinking, emotional reactions, and guiding principles. These are the things that we pull out. So here's a, a, a little thing: um, when you first start. You'll do a listening session and you may end up pulling maybe 35 or 40 of those types of concepts, those three things out of a transcript. When you get really good at it and you're good at the other parts of the book where you're learning how to make sure a person's feeling safe, and then you can get 120 concepts out of that same session. So you can get started, you can get concepts at the interior cognition level, the inner thinking, the emotional reactions, and the guiding principles. When you're first starting out, it's just going to be fewer of them. And as you start going back through the transcripts, or somebody else might be going through the transcripts because you're like, I hate doing that. (laughs) Um, They're going to say, hey, here's places where you didn't notice that they were implying something that we, I call a pull tab and you didn't pull that tab to get into what that interior cognition was. And so here's a way. So that's one of the other sensors is you're noticing pull tabs. You're noticing when there's something that sort of imply there might be something back in there and you can ask about it. You can ask about it using a variety of approaches like micro reflection or because, um, or, you know, trying to ladder back in history. Like, where did that come from? What was your thinking before that, that built this, um, that made this happen? So there's a bunch of those techniques that you can use. Those are all in the book. And that helps us get from 35 concepts per transcript to 120. Now, granted, 
I don't always get up to 120 because sometimes the purpose that is just not, um, it's not conducive to real richness. And so you have to try really hard and you might get to 60 and that's good. Um, I did a study right at the beginning of the pandemic with founders, entrepreneurs, uh, there are a variety of types of entrepreneurs um, so that we could understand their thinking styles and so that we could support them better and understand a little bit about where the discrimination is happening. And what was really interesting was Given someone who wanted to hear their interior cognition, we went deep. These founders, these entrepreneurs, they have a lot of interior cognition happening. And we got to go really deep. Our listening sessions lasted way longer than an hour. We don't stop a listening session ever. <laughs> it goes until it's done and we've gone through all the topics and the other person is happy. Um, if the other person is starting to feel uncomfortable, then we'll figure out why and we'll stop it. So these are the kinds of sensors that are being built. And that's how you can still do this, even though you don't have your sensor completely built, because you can still get something out of it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I like the metaphor that you had about pulling the tab. I, I'm going to steal that one from you for sure, because uh, here is a tab that I hadn't um, yep. prepared for, <laughs> but I want to get into. So one of the things you mentioned is... Um, you have to create a space for someone to share their story and you have to encourage them or guide them or um, help them in in a help, list them. help yeah. them in that listening session mm -hmm. to express what yeah. they want to express. Um, but you also mentioned, and you also mentioned that when you get a transcript, you're also able to extract some of these concepts, right? And then I have that, a question. So, yeah, and then I have a question okay, around ahead. it. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. that, let, is, is that true that, that uh, based on a transcript, you're also able to extract, extract some of these concepts? Yeah, it's one in the same, basically. Um, you will be trying to help the person unfold their interior cognition. The person, as they start realizing that you're really interested in what they have to say and really interested in what they thought, what went through their mind, not their opinions, not their preferences. Those are exterior layer things. Um, and what when they realize they've got somebody who's like really interested, it's like it, it starts building and more and more come out in the session. What you're constantly sensing is like, are we at the interior cognition layer? Is there a pull tab? Is there something implied? Is there something that I'm he's they're bringing back up again? And like, wait, what's the why are you mentioning this again? Right? You can ask a lot of different questions about it to help them unfold their interior cognition using some of those techniques. And so the idea is that when we go through the transcript, they're one and the same. We'll see those interior cognition topics, those concepts that we help them unfold. Mm -hmm. Okay. We may, so one of the things that happens when we're doing it in real time, things, things come out tangled. When, when you and I are talking, we'll maybe talk about two concepts at once or a, con a inner thinking and emotional reaction all tangled up. And when we're looking at it in the transcript, we can untangle it. And that's really powerful because we can start to see it more clearly. We can also see, oh, you know, if I had only asked it this way or, you know, said this or noticed that um, they were like trying not to answer this question, <laughs> then I would have done a better job. The concept of garbage in is garbage out applies here. It, it, the, the, the output of your conversation, like, Will be ju will be judged by the quality of how well you can listen, how well you can notice, how well you can recognize these tabs, and 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 again help somebody to express this. Um, now I'm curious, like, okay, let's say you have an expert listener in these sessions, um, and you capture their result. Have you seen examples where technology steps in and helps us actually to analyze? what what has been said because mm. like if the asking or the listening part is the i think maybe it requires the most human skill and being in the moment improvising that's the hardest sort of to duplicate maybe 
uh, the second part seems to be more deductive, more rational, more, I don't know. What's your take on this? Okay. So natural language processing. <laughs> I would love to partner up with a team who's working at the forefront of natural language processing to build a tool that recognizes inner thinking, that recognizes emotional reaction, that recognizes a guiding principle, which is a personal rule. They are not easy to recognize. Okay. You and me as humans, we can recognize it once we know what they are. Um, and we haven't actually gone into examples of what they are, uh, which we might want to do. But once we know what they are, we can recognize that natural language processing has more to do with analytical deduction or reduction of words and syllables. So it doesn't recognize that yet. I think it can be trained to. Would be. I would like to... Yeah. yeah, I would like to work with somebody to do that um, because we have to do it all by hand right now because we have to recognize it. Yeah. I, I'm super fascinated by this concept because uh, uh, AI and natural language processing, like large language models, the way and the speed at which these things are de developing right now, uh, mm -hmm. uh, extracting meaning and summarizing pieces of text, like uh, it's insane. So, um, yeah. Uh, this is maybe just a way to say that probably the human part of being actual in a conversation, making a connection, uh, <laughs> giving somebody time and space and attention to share their story, like that's, that's maybe, yeah, let me say it that way. That's maybe the hard part, the hardest part of this mm -hmm. entire process. Like, and then recognizing these concepts, that's maybe still hard, but. Uh, it takes a human right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I actually offer a service because it takes time mm -hmm. and not everybody has time and not everybody likes to do it. But let me tell you, oh, it makes you a better listener. You, you just, if you want to become a better listener, this is the fastest path to becoming a better listener <laughs> is to go through it and try to pull all those concepts out of a transcript. Seriously. Mm. Um, I teach a really good course on it that's available on my website. Um, that I just went through it with a whole bunch of people in live practice and it brought tears to my eyes how well they could recognize mm -hmm. these things mm -hmm. after taking the course. Yeah. Um, I would love it if we could get national language mm -hmm. processing going that direction. I don't see a lot of grad students or teams who are working um, <laughs> like raising their hands and saying, oh, hey, I want to do this. I had one person who was really interested in it. Um, but I don't, I lost track of that person. And I don't think that he had a background in national natural language processing. So I'm not sure if he was connected to the teams that were doing that. So if you're out there, Miguel, come back. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody new who's maybe already, or somebody new who's maybe already doing this. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. these days. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, yeah. I have I have uh, sort of uh, a few questions to wrap up this uh, conversation. Uh, one question that's always on my mind is what are some of the common pitfalls or common mistakes you see people making when they try to adopt this or maybe, yeah, starting starting with this? Um, there's one uh, mistake that I see. Otherwise, I don't see otherwise it's all just you know you got to set that sensor up you got to build the sensor um so it's not a mistake right it's just that the sensor isn't quite there yet we'll you know we'll build it and work on it and try again the one thing that i see though is people saying to themselves well i've done interviews and if you're going to ask me to do this without a list of questions um, and not analyze it, but instead synthesize it, then I don't believe you. This should be deductive. Abductive? No. And you're going to make me do this? Then I'm going to act like a robot. <laughs> and I'm just going to like parrot back what the person says um, because it looks like that's what you're doing. So what is the, th not. What is the yeah. thinking model there? <laughs> I think the thinking model is... Um, I, I reject the ideas of abductive and of synthesis. Um, just, just 
Because it's different, because it hasn't been something that a lot of organizations have done. Now, I have worked with a lot of organizations that have gotten a lot of value out of it. Um, True, I've worked with a few um, startups where they still went off the end of the runway and crashed. (laughs) Um, But it is incredibly powerful. There was an airline that I worked with where we did eight studies, one after the other, which was really wonderful um, because we were able to build a really deep understanding that you know, went beyond just, oh, we're going to support the business traveler because there were a, a bunch of different thinking styles. Um, and in fact, business traveler could be a different thinking style when they get on board with their toddler and their, you know, family to go see grandma, right? They're not in business travel thinking mode. And in fact, business travel isn't even the name of the thinking mode. The thinking mode that was most common uh, was, you know, be productive and make the most out of this day. So as I'm traveling, I'm going to, you know, write the slide deck for whatever presentation I'm going to give, or as I'm traveling, I'm going to go through my client list or, you know, write the emails that I need. As I'm traveling, I'm going to knit the sweater um, for my granddaughter who's just been born that I'm going to go visit. As I'm traveling, I'm going to, um, you know, read that book that I promised my friend I would read so I could talk to her about it in book club or whatever. Uh, Be productive can take a lot of different ways right it doesn't have to be associated with business yeah yeah so (laughs) rejecting uh synthesis and uh abductive yeah reasoning yeah i i think that that's just the i I, that's the only way that i've seen people like really really mess it up Mm. all the other ways are just like we're trying to make that sensor Mm. and Mm. oops i missed that Mm. or um I got scared and I couldn't think of one of the techniques to say. Um, yep. There's a technique that's like earlier you said, and you just bring up another topic that they already you know, talked about, or maybe you do that too many times and the person's all like, dude, I already told you everything. <laughs> I went through my mind about it. And you're like, oops, it's just because you know I'm a little nervous or my sensor isn't built quite yet. That's okay. Mm. You have to go through it so you can build the sensor. Mm. So it's not a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. So much to, uh, again, double click upon. <laughs> but um, now let's cycle back to the start of our conversation where we started. You wrote a book. And I'm always curious, like, if you go through the tedious process of sitting down and writing, I don't know how many words. Um, oh, per day? Well, <laughs> in general. But did you encounter any new questions like while you were writing this like yeah i would love to figure this out but we need to write a second book about it like is there was there a new question that sort of emerged for you uh not so much a new question um and there is going to be a second book coming out which is going to be about thinking styles uh so it's not in this book um but it is in the course the the it wasn't a question that came up but it was a little bit of a shift in vocabulary Because when you use the word listen, you imply that you're talking about someone who is not deaf doing this. You're talking about someone who um, maybe is, you know, listening, you're listening to somebody who's able to talk or even likes to talk. Uh, So one of the things that I did is I talked about how that word listen really just means communicate, take in receive. And you can communicate not necessarily by audio, but also by texting with somebody, doing a chat session with somebody, doing it written, doing it drawing, um, doing it over time. So it's not just one big session, but you know it takes place for five minutes um, every morning for two weeks or something. So there's a lot uh, I, that was the thing that changed with this book was this idea that, you know, it can happen in a lot of ways. I knew this, but I had never said it that way. Mm. And so I'm saying it very clearly in this book. Hey, choose the method, the medium, how to communicate, how to receive the communications that works for the person that you're listening to. Oh, and also that works for you. 
listening beyond ha- listening yeah. beyond the ears. Yeah, <laughs> listening exactly, with all right? your senses. <laughs> exactly, listening with all your senses. It's really all about connecting your mind to their mind, mm. and that's starting to sound Vulcan, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. We're mm. trying. We're trying to get that connection. I used to joke like, if I had a telepathy server, I wouldn't need to do listening sessions because I could just, mm. you know, maybe a, a telepathy server and a recording. So a person could say, okay, I'm going to turn on the recording of my thoughts as I'm addressing this purpose, um, and I'm going to turn it off as I'm not addressing it, and I'll turn it on again as I'm addressing it again, and I'll turn it off, you know, or whatever, and then I'll just go through all of that. <laughs> right? The listening session is just a way for them to communicate to me how, you know, what inner thinking, what emotional reactions, what guiding principles, what set different things off in the past. Without going into uh, a new rabbit hole, but I would almost say it's not even (laughs) communicating to you. It's just making it tangible, getting it out of their head and into the world. And then for anyone yeah. who's interested in knowing what is there. Indy, we, mm-hmm. re- we really have to sort of find closure in our conversation, uh, but there is one important thing we need to do, and that is a lot of fun, uh, because uh, we've been on the show on a tangent with authors lately. I don't know why, but uh, somehow it happened. And um, we've been doing a lot of giveaways of books and uh, we're going to do one here as well. Uh, The formula is the same as in the previous episodes. We're going to do a raffle. uh, So you're going to ask uh, us, uh, you're going to give us a challenge, ask uh, us a question and uh, people need to respond to the question uh, on this video or audio recording uh, where they are listening. And then uh, in about two weeks time, we'll do a raffle amongst the correct answers and then they will get a special copy of the book now the question is what is the question what is the challenge uh that people need i get to, to give uh, the challenge you get to give the challenge <laughs> yeah. obviously yeah yeah so as you're building that sensor what are you listening to what are you trying to help somebody unfold and they don't have to have read the book to know that. They just have to have listened. Have listened to me for the last 45 for, minutes. For the last 45 <laughs> minutes. So leave an answer. Um, and the instructions will be in the show notes how to enter this raffle. Uh, Indy, okay, final, final question. If somebody made it all the way here, what do you hope is the one thing that they will take away? I hope one thing that they'll take away is that this is a, this is not a quick fix. And you can come back and revisit this again later and later and later and come back and keep coming back. I've got a lot of materials on the website, a lot of essays, a lot of recordings, a lot of presentations, a lot of videos. I've got the courses. I've got the books when you start to get into it. This doesn't have to be something you do right away. So that's, that's the long, the takeaway is that it's, it's a long, it's a long wave, right? It's like the swell at, at ocean. Take a take your own time. Mm. There's that word time again. That's encouraging and uh, knowing that uh, be prepared, <laughs> sort of the be be mindful of your own expectations, not to get discouraged and uh, quit too soon. So, um, yeah. Indy, um, thank you for coming back on the show. I'm happy that the book is out there and that the message is out there. Uh, who knows when we'll do? Uh, we'll, when we'll complete the, the trilogy? <laughs> I'm sure there will be an opportunity for that. Uh, but for now, um, again, thank you for coming on and, and sharing what's been going on on your end. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you, Mark. I really enjoyed this conversation with Indy, and I hope you did as well and got something useful out of it. If you want to participate in the contest and make chance to win a special edition of Indy's book, read all the details in the show notes. My name is Mark Fontaine and I want to thank you for tuning in to the Service Design Show and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.